recording. Okay. All right. Um, can everybody see? Yeah. So, welcome to this uh, webinar on gas condensate PVT. Um, what's really important and why? And uh, my colleagues uh, who were on the original paper that we presented back in 1998, 23 years ago, Avon Favong and Tao Young, both with uh, Equinor, and really ha happy that we could all be together kind of as a, a anniversary. So we're gonna we're gonna go through more or less the same uh, slide deck that we actually used in the presentation of the original paper, change it a little bit. Um, there's quite a bit of material, and so I just want to make a comment that um, there'll be electronic material provided to everybody joining the webinar, the original paper, um, maybe a 2003 update of that, sli the slide presentations, the Q&A notes that we'll make at the end of the, this presentation, and a link to the video. So don't worry about if you miss something or don't quite catch something that uh, you'll have plenty of chances to, to, to get that information on a second look. Um, and the questions, if you can just uh, to help out a little bit, I think the name automatically comes in this link in this web, uh, WebEx system. Uh, your name, you don't have to write it, I think, but um, if you can put a slide number there uh, where your question's coming from, if it's specific, and then just a brief text, that'll help us uh, uh, handle those questions during the Q&A session. Anyway, um, the goal of the paper was to give a review of the you know, key PVT data that dictated both recovery of gas and condensate and the well performance of gas condensate wells where condensate blockage is an issue. And the gas condensate engineering is really uh, mostly, I usually say 80, 90% traditional gas engineering that you find in all sorts of books and papers together with some extra more complicated stuff, which I call magic, which includes a positive uh, uh, additional uh, uh, revenues from the surface condensate production and the negative of well productivity potentially being lost due to this near well buildup of a liquid uh, saturation, which reduces the gas relative permeability. And uh, that uh, third is gas cycling, and if one wants to look into gas uh, injection, which can be both a, a positive thing to recover more recovery than by pure depletion. But if you don't have a good volumetric sweep, it can be a very expensive um, effort. So that it's, uh, it's got an uncertainty to it. Now, the topics in the, in the paper that are touched on in the paper and that we'll go through today in the presentation are PVT experiments related to gas condensates, uh, initial fluids in place calculations and depletion recovery factors, PVT modeling, condensate blockage, and gas cycling of condensate reservoirs. Um, now, these actually make up the main topics that are covered in a five-day course that we do on gas condensate. So there's a lot of material, certainly a lot more than I can cover in this 15, 20-minute summary. But uh, I want to show these slides and kind of make our way through them so that you can pick up on some of the issues that you're most interested in and help on developing those questions for the Q&A session. So basically, the list of priorities of what's important of PVT in a given field will vary from field to field in the situation. So, for example, a field development strategy, whether you're planning on only depleting the reservoir or possibly doing gas cycling, if it's a low permeability or high permeability, uh, particularly in regard to the condensate blockage impact, if it's saturated or highly undersaturated, can have a big effect on what's important. If it's onshore or offshore, Again, can be very important um, because of the number of wells being limited and the cost of, of wells and sampling and so forth being very different. And then whether you're at the discovery or delineation or development phase of a field. So all these things come into play and we do comment on that in, in the paper. So we don't have the same, these are the important PVT every time, but that can vary from case to case. So on the PVT experiments, there's basically two, the constant composition expansion test, where we're measuring the dew point pressure and the, the gas C factor above the dew point pressure. Basically, those are the two main important measurements. You also measure below the dew point, the relative amount of the two phases condensating gas, less important. 
The other and the really most important experiment for gas condensates is the constant volume depletion test. And the reason for that is that it starts at the dew point and it basically maps how the composition changes of the gas being removed during depletion. And in particular, the heavier components of the gas composition that end up forming surface condensate, basically this additional revenue from, from these fields. So the YI of the heavy components is a very, very important uh, measurement that comes from the CVD test. You also get the moles removed, uh, again, the Z factor that takes into account compositional change together with pressure and another measure of the relative oil volume. Now, if we're looking at initial fluids in place and depletion recoveries, it's the gas Z factor, the variation of this, well, let's just call it C6 plus um, in the removed gas during depletion. And basically, we're going to use a surrogate for instead of putting a, a multi stage separator process at the surface, we can approximate the amount of uh, condensate volume by just looking at how much C6 plus is in that removed gas or produced gas. And uh, it's a very good approximation. I mean, and it's basically uh, can be shown that it's the mole fraction of that uh, proportional with the condensate divided by one minus or C5 minus uh, for the million standard cubic feet. So basically that ratio there is, um, is, um, is used as a sugar surrogate to talk about uh, condensate volumes. And we've also got some topics uh, on compositional variation with depth, the dew point pressure, and gas oil contacts that can also, of course, influence the uh, in, in initial fluids in place. Now, the gas C factor will always be important for gas condensate reservoirs, just like gas reservoirs, because it affects directly the initial gas in place. You're 5% off on the gas C factor, you're 5% off on the initial gas in place. However, what most people or a lot of people are not aware of is that you're also going to be 5% off on the initial stock tank barrels of condensate in place. So getting the gas C factor is very important. Basically, remember all that surface condensate you're producing at the surface is being carried in solution with the gas in the gas. So if you get the gas volume wrong, you're going to get the condensate volume wrong. In addition, for the depletion recoveries, the cumulative gas and the cumulative um, condensate volumes are also uh, affected by the Z factor in the same way as for dry gas reservoirs. Gas condensate viscosity, there's basically two viscosities we're particularly interested in. The one is single phase gas condensate viscosity or the gas phase itself. Uh, they're usually calculated by the PVT lab, but they can be measured, uh, particularly if the value is above 0.05 or the range 0.05 to 0.1 centipoise, then we may be able to make measurements in the laboratory. Um, on the condensate, viscosity, particularly the condensate flowing near the well bore where you get this blockage effect, it's difficult to get the lab to, to take the reservoir condensate dropout and measure viscosities on that. So normally what we do is we recommend using separator oil or separator condensate that brought to reservoir conditions to measure some viscosities that are then used to tune the viscosity model together with the equation of state model. Um, then on the CVD compositional variation, basically it's used to forecast how the CGR will vary as you drop below the dew point pressure, uh, the average reservoir pressure dropping below the dew point pressure, how that CGR will vary. Um, that will then, of course, lead to the condensate and gas recovery profiles. Now it will assume, basically, the CVD experiment is a constant hydrocarbon pore volume. So we are neglecting the water expansion, the pore compressibility, and water influx in these calculate, or in these measurements. But basically, if you know the expected recovery of condensate by depletion, by definition, you know the initial, you know what will produce by depletion, you then know the target of a potential gas cycling project. So that's also coming directly from the, the CCVE and CVD. Now, there's an equation given in, in the paper, basically, that uses the CC and CVD data. Um, the little or s solution oil gas ratio is assumed at a given pressure to represent a, within some percent, the producing oil gas ratio, uh, CGR, and that can be 
pattern from the composition of the uh, this XC6 plus and the CBD gas. So let's just look at some data that's given in the paper. So from the CCE, we need the initial pressure, dew point pressure, and the Z factors of those two pressures. The CBD data provides the moles of the reservoir gas removed at each stage and the composition of that removed gas. Uh, this information together allows you to compute the recovery factor of surface gas product and recovery factor of the surface condensate. And if we look graphically at that, we'll see that, you know, from initial pressure down to the dew point, which in this case is here about 420 bar, the recovery factor of condensate and gas products are identical. As soon as you drop below the dew point, the average pressure in the reservoir drops below the dew point, the recovery factor of the condensate drops off more rapidly than does the surface gas. And particularly at low pressures, we, we may not even reach 40% of the condensate recovery where we're reaching over 80% of the surface gas recovery. So those calculations allow you to or the, these PVT data allow you to make this kind of template recovery plot um, straight from the PVT data. Now, the other concept that is introduced is so-called sampling and the representativity of samples that are collected in gas condensate fields. And basically, we, we argue that there are two types of representative samples. And the one is that it represents the reservoir fluids. Um, they're being produced. If it's uncontaminated fluid sample, basically the, all of the components in the distribution are coming from the reservoir. And we need our PVT model, be it an equation of state or Blackwell table, to represent the PVT properties of that produced well stream. It doesn't have to be a well stream that represents what we call the in situ. Uh, representative sample, which is usually a sample that would represent the initial fluid in place, but it may be at a specific depth, and it could vary with depth, it could vary from fault block to fault block. So there are two different types of representative samples. So if you've got data that has good PVT measurement quality, that data should be used in developing the U.S. model, even though it's not in situ representative of a particular depth. And vice versa, you may have an MDT type sample that you feel is comfortably giving you a representative sample at a given depth. But if the laboratory messes up the PVT measurements, you don't want to use that sample in developing the PVT models. Now, when it comes to dew point pressure, we, 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 we basically recommend um, two types of dew point pressures. The one is basically the dew point pressure where the producing well stream or the reservoir gas starts becoming leaner. That means that the producing CGR is going to drop. You have less revenue from the condensate. It's what we call the engineering dew point. Now, you could have the, the thermodynamic dew point is where there's an, a small amount of incipient condensate that appears in the PVT cell. Um, that Getting that right be very important in predicting down dip oil by predicting gas oil contact from a gas condensate sample. Now, if it's not near saturated, this thermodynamic dew point is not particularly important to get right. And on occasion, the difference between the engineering dew point and the thermodynamic dew point can be hundreds, if not up to a thousand psi different. So anyway, that's just a, an issue that we bring out in the paper. Um, that's not really discussed too many other places. And once we've got our samples and PDT data, we basically try to build an equation of state model. Um, from that, we generate black oil PVT models. And then particular for the black oil models, you're interested in the solution, condensate gas ratio, little rs. Sometimes it's uh, written capital RV. Sometimes that's written capital RV. And the gas formation volume factor, which is written BGD, D meaning dry, um, which is different than the traditional gas formation volume fa factor definition. And the reason for that is anywhere from one to five to as much as 15% of the reservoir gas when it comes to the surface doesn't remain surface gas. The traditional BG formulation assumes that 
all of the reservoir gas becomes surface gas. In the case you have a condensate, as much as up to 15% of that gas turns into condensate, and you have to redefine this formation volume factor to be consistent. Now, on the US modeling, there's a lot to discuss on that, but basically, we talk about the molar compositions, how important they are, being measured by the splitting of the C7 plus, uh, tuning parameters, developing a common US for multiple reservoir fluids, and reducing the number of components for use in, for example, reservoir simulation from maybe something that might be 20 or 30 or 40 components when we tune the PBT data down to something that's usually less than 10 components when we do compositional reservoir simulation. That's also discussed. The Blackwell PBT properties are defined again that had been done earlier um, in the uh, early 1980s, basically the formation uh, volume factor of the uh, gas and oil and the solution uh, gas oil ratio and solution oil gas ratio of condensates. And, and as I mentioned before, these two properties are the most important properties to get right in the Blackwell PVT property. We also talk about a term, little or s over dg drive, which basically represents if you got one cubic meter of reservoir gas volume, how many standard cubic meters of surface product do you get, basically? And that's this ratio of little or s to bg. And it's essentially representing the mole fraction uh, in the removed gas of the CBD experiment of these liquid forming components, C6 plus. So that's a, that's a term, sometimes it's called the geologist formation volume factor of oil for a gas condensate reservoir. By the way, that's also what we use in mapping uh, compositional variation with depth and from fault block to fault block or with you know, different reservoirs. Um, if you're using black oil properties, use that little rs over dg instead of the composition of the C6+. plus. Um, and we also discussed some of the challenges of generating Blackwell PVT tables. Uh, consistency, uh, one of the important things is knowing whether your Blackwell tables are consistent with your laboratory CVD data. And is it consistent with the equation of state model? Uh, there's a lot of ways to get inconsistency. And so we discussed that topic and it's a very important also extrapolating saturated uh, black oil tables non monotonicity which is very common for the bo and the rs capital rs um, for gas condensates are often non monotonic with pressure which for example can't be used in eclipse 100 it's not allowed to have non monotonic bo and, and rs then handling saturated gas oil systems where you want consistency at the gas oil contact and then the other is initializing reservoirs with compositional gradients using a black oil formulation. Uh, again, regarding compositional variation with depth, the gradient of the, the, the grading of composition with depth is usually expressed as the solution, the little RS solution in the CGR versus depth, definitely can have an impact on the initial condensate in place, initial gas in place. Um, and then it can also have an effect on recoveries of condensate in particular. Now, if it's a near saturated system, what you'll find, in fact, is that having a strong compositional gradient, you actually won't see much effect on the depletion condensate reserves, not recovery factors, but the reserves don't change much with and without the gradient. Whereas if it's more undersaturated, then it can have a bigger effect. And then we also discuss a little bit the uncertainties in predicting a gas oil contact based on a gas condensate sample. Uh, these are some uh, basically technologies and uh, things that came after the paper. This is uh, this paper here on the left. The figure on the left is for a Norwegian field, Smirbolk, uh, I believe it's the Smirbolk field. Um, and it shows composition versus depth, and we're using C7 plus more percent to map that. Um, on the right is the basically the MDT type uh, open hole formation testing type of tools and surface uh, readout of, of data uh, during sampling using open hole formation logging tools. 
there's been a lot of technology developments in this area since 1998 that are not covered in the paper. Then we've got condensate blockage, and there, uh, the one co-author, David, here with us, uh, basically he did his, his PhD work on that and uh, uh, established how to quantify this condensate blockage effect both accurately and uh, in, in the simplest possible way, basically defining all of the um, first order effects, what's important and why on the PVT side and on the rock side. Now that work uh, that basically you have relative permeability that's a function of this ratio KGKO. It's a very complicated topic. Maybe some people will ask me questions about it, but the KGKO term is actually just a pure PVT property together with the producing CGR. And uh, Avon was uh, was uh, basically uh, received a very special award, the Cedric Ferguson Award for the work that he did in this paper um, that was also recognized as the best reservoir engineering paper in 1996. Um, here we're showing the effect of uh, basically the, the rock itself uh, on the KRG. This is the red line. And then how you can get improvement of KRG due to high velocities in vertical wells that have radial cylindrical flow with very high velocities near the well bore. So basically you've got this velocity here, the VS and the capillary number term is coming from the gas rate. And then you've got two PVT properties here that are important for converting uh, to capillary number, which is correlated uh, in correlations to get the improvement in relative permeability to gas with velocity. Uh, this shows basically the impact of uh, the richness of the fluid. If you have a rich fluid, then that fluid, if you bring it to near well conditions, uh, might, if for a very rich fluid, uh, just bring that in 10%. And, and if you do a CCE test of the producing rich 300 barrel per million uh, sample, you bring it to 100 bar, and you'll basically get something like 10%, maybe a little bit more of the total PVT cell will uh, contain condensate. And the KRG will basically be at its lowest value. And this lowest value will typically range, depending on the rock, from 0.05 to 0.1 for the richest fluids. As the producing well stream gets leaner and leaner, you basically march up this curve here, and the KRG is improving because of that uh, flowing stream through the near well region becoming leaner. Anyway, that's discussed, and the PVT issues around condensate blockage are talked about in, in this paper. Now, the last topic is gas cycling, and basically what we're emphasizing is that the CCE and the CVD data give us the expected recovery of condensate versus depletion pressure below the dew point. And if you know the initial in place condensate and you know the depletion recovery, you know the difference in those two numbers is the target for gas cycling recovery below the dew point. So we look at we look at that basically, and we look at what's left in the reservoir when you start a gas injection project. And this is just an example plot for a high pressure, uh, highly undersaturated gas condensate reservoir. We've got 900 bar initial pressure. The dew points around 400 bar. And basically, the red curve is showing the expected recovery factor by pure depletion. And then between the green and the red curve here, this here is expressing the amount of condensate left in the reservoir. If we started a cycling project, for example, at 200 bar, how much of that remaining condensate in the reservoir would be still in solution in the reservoir gas. Because that condensate, we can, if we do injection at that pressure, will be recovered miscibly. Whereas in this case at 200 bar, most of the remaining stock tank barrels has, is in the retrograde condensate phase, and you'll only recover part of that retrograde condensate by vaporization-dominated process. So all this information is being provided 
simply by the CCE CBD data. So we illustrate that for, in this case, under saturated reservoir. And in this case, if that same fluid system was found initially saturated, then the magnitude of the depletion recovery, of course, would be much lower. There would be a much larger target at your 200 bar. In this case, almost 80% would still be in the reservoir. And the amount that's in the solution in the gas and, and the amount that's in the retrograde would be quantified. So these red and green curves, this assessment, basically um, can come out of purely the PVT data from a laboratory experiment. And I think with that, made it through most of the material. It just summarizes kind of the topics that were covered, that are covered in the paper. And from this point forward, we're gonna let the audience ask questions and kind of drive the discussion and hopefully get both Avon and Tao uh, answering the questions. So we'll uh, move to a blank sheet of paper and I'll try to facilitate repeating the questions and then I'll let my colleagues hopefully answer most of those questions. Good. And on that note, uh, Tao, if you have um, a couple of comments uh, related to the presentation, or the Q&A part. Uh, yes, uh, I can say a few words and uh... We made a joke about uh, like uh, old sounds, a uh, good sounds that actually last very long. And uh, this paper actually, when we actually revisit uh, after 20 years, there's uh, not a lot of new things actually uh, happen in this 20 years time, which is a pretty long time. And uh, uh, I sent uh, Curtis uh, two slides and he included uh, into the, uh, the, the slide stack. And uh, one thing is uh, talking about the viscosity. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yes. And most of the PVT labs, they don't really measure the single phase uh, because uh, we have a very good uh, correlation. Uh, you can almost use any correlation to estimate the normal gas condensate viscosity, and they are pretty accurate. That's why if you, go, if you look, closely look at the PVT report, you actually find out all these gas viscosity are calculated by correlations. So, but this is not always the case, like Curtis mentioned. And uh, we start to see some uh, like uh, uh, fluids, the gas condensate, they have a quite high uh, single phase uh, viscosity and much higher than typically we're talking about because Curtis mentioned this uh, threshold uh, 0 0.05 and we start to see something almost close to oil. So it's like a 0 0.2, 0 0.3, this kind of range. So if uh, no measurement has been done and uh, just taking the number by correlation as a granted, and then uh, it is uh, actually uh, can be, something can be wrong. And also on this uh, estimate uh, liquid, uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, good uh, correlations that uh, people use in the industry, like uh, corresponding uh, principle, uh, corresponding state principle of this costing model. So if you don't have the one Curtis suggested, like uh, make a separate oil measurement and actually get a better model. So you can use actually the corresponding principle and uh, then you can tune your LBC based on the predictions from the, uh, from the, a corresponding uh, principle uh, viscosity model, which I believe is a uh, is more predictable model than the LBC. And uh, another comment I want to make is on this uh, gradient. Right. So, uh, so Curtis, let's... if you the gradient model in our industry, uh, actually over the twenty uh, more than twenty years, there is uh, really not any change. So we're still stay with uh, like uh, the gravity segregation, which is the ISO model, isothermal model that we have. And also there's a different uh, models uh, talking about the thermal. Uh, all of these models, they are more mainly used to match the data you have, not use a model to predict the gradient. As you can see, this is a, this is really, this is actually quite a good model already, but still, individual sample prediction showing the gradient is uh, quite far from the one like, uh, you know, 
the red uh, dashed line, and it's quite far from there. So this really uh, uh, come to the point. If we have any more information than the PPT samples, we can use to help to define the gradient. Especially like uh, Curtis mentioned, if you have an undersaturate system, that actually has a lot of impact on your fluid in place. And a saturated system, when you start to really the reservoir pressure will come down and the, the, the gradient will disappear. And so for the undersaturated one, so there is a different tools in the industry. Actually, I mentioned two here. One is uh, actually the downhole fluid analyzer. This one is uh, used quite a lot, especially in uh, deep water, all this area. It's not very much in Norway, but uh, quite uh, many applications in other places, in other part of the world. And uh, the, the lower picture, is actually something new that we work uh, quite uh, extensively recently uh, using the uh, mud gas data. So the mud gas data from uh, this picture are from Solimbushi, but you get uh, all the services from all the big vendors. They have a similar tools. Uh, you know, you get the mud gas data that can really help you define the gradient. If you do have a swan gradient, you actually can see that from your mud gas data as well. Okay, the last thing what I want to mention is uh, Curtis has a paper on the liquid rich shale, this uh, PVT for the liquid uh, rich shale. That's uh, talking about a lot of things are uh, special for the shale reservoirs, which is uh, not covered uh, when this paper was uh, uh, published in uh, 1998. That's all I want to comment. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Yeah. Very good. And we'll actually get to, there's a lot of questions actually on that last note uh, from Tao related to, you know, how these concepts or how they are relevant for Titan conventionals. But before we go there, I wanted to ask, uh, ask uh, even actually, that actually wrote a paper back in uh, 1994 called the Accurate in Situ Compositions in Petroleum Reservoirs, where, uh, um, it was, where at least I think it's one of the first places where we uh, differentiated between uh, in situ representative samples and reservoir representative samples. And um, there's been three, four, five questions uh, about that. And if we can elaborate a little bit more on that distinction uh, between in situ representative samples and uh, reservoir representative samples. <clears throat> okay, let me, I think I start with the reservoir representative samples because the, the main requirement for a reservoir representative sample is that it's from the reservoir, preferably uncontaminated, especially that's really the best. Uh, you, you can, if you don't have any clean samples, you have to stay with the contaminated, but that they are from the reservoir and that you have quality measured data. And that meaning both the composition is well known and that the quality checks that you do on the PVT measurements show that the data are reliable and of good quality. And those samples are the samples used to develop the equation of state model, which is then can be used usually for several blocks, several zones, and is usually like a common equation of state used for the entire reservoir. The in situ samples, they are, can be reservoir representative, if they have good PVT data and good compositions. But the, 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 the main thing from the in situ representative samples is that they should be used to define the initial composition, either at the point, if you believe that they, you have a, a compositional gradient, or for a reservoir interval or zone, if you believe you don't have a, a strong gradient due to undersaturation or other effects in the reservoir. So, so it's, it's really, and, 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 and very important is that the reservoir representative sample is used for tuning of any models and, and, and developing an equation of state, but the in situ is then used for developing black oil tables and to define the initial compositions in the reservoir. Very, very good. Uh, and to take this kind of back into the shale domain and, and uh, on uh, your comment there as well, uh, Tao, uh, and on your paper, Curtis, uh, how some of these concepts here uh, apply or are different for uh, shale reservoirs. Uh, if you can comment a couple of the sense on that, uh, Curtis, and maybe there are some other comments as well. 
Okay, so, um, well, I guess uh, what's different, I guess, the, if I'm just going to make, try to make a, a, a quick list, the one is that we have in these tight end conventional reservoirs, I think the one exception is Bakken, um, is that the range of the fluids uh, is, 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 is really huge, okay? Meaning that we go from lean to almost dry gas towards lower GOR oils. And you've got everything in between. So you've got volatile oils, you've got near critical oils, you've got rich gas condensates, and then you've got lean gas condensates. So one of the big challenges is being able to build PVT models, equations of state, Blackwell tables, and so forth that cover this whole gamut, the whole range of, of fluids. Um, I guess that's the one. Uh, the other uh, is probably on sampling because typically you're Flowing bottom wall pressure is much less or often less. It doesn't have to be, but the saturation pressure, which you don't know, okay, but it's it's basically very low flowing bottom wall pressures. Maybe the condition where you actually get early samples in the first few months of production. And you can't get samples the first day or two like you would in a normal conventional reservoir because producing 98% water or very high quantities of water. So basically sampling uh, leads you to the, to the situation where you seldom, if ever, get what we call in situ representative samples, ever, or, yeah. And, and there's so many of these unconventional wells, they don't take samples on all of the wells. So. It's, uh, I guess the whole, I'd just say the, the topic of sampling is, is a challenge for unconventionals. And those are two of the things. Uh, maybe, Ty, you want to, you know, you've done a lot of work on this uh, in the unconventionals also with the mud gas. Uh, maybe I'll think of something extra if. What well, about the blockage, uh, Curtis? Like, uh, is, is blockage uh, a potential issue uh, in, in tight unconventionals, uh, as it can be in many places for, for uh, Conventional reservoirs. Yeah. So um, generally, not is what we found um, for gas condensates. the The reason being is um, if you study the papers uh, that uh, Avid and I wrote on this three region gas condensate flow model, the the region nearest the well bore is a steady state flow region or what enters that region is what enters the well bore. And then you've got region two where you're below the dew point, but the liquid dropping out in the region two doesn't have enough mobility to flow. So basically it's an accumulation of condensate region. And then the region three out beyond that is single phase gas. And so in conventional reservoirs, this region one develops often quite quickly and quite extensively because you're flowing many hundreds, if not thousands of pore volumes, uh, let's say that take the first meter around the well bore per day. So you're seeing dropout after dropout times 10, times 100, times 1,000, and you build up this region one mobility saturation. But in unconventionals, you have a much, much larger surface area at the well bore and much lower rates per surface area. So you, it, it just takes kind of like forever or a long, long time to build up even a small region of, a, a small zone of this region one where you actually have mobility. Uh, so that, that's my explanation of kind of why you don't see the same kind of productivity loss in, in the unconventionals uh, as you do in the conventional. And, and bringing that over to to Tao, I mean, uh, Tao, you've done a lot of work uh, on the PVT side for a lot of these uh, shale uh, resources, and 
one thing, you know, you talked about gradients for conventional reservoirs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of uh, the fluid heterogeneity concept and how fluid changed and how, you know, you can potentially deal with that or account for that in these uh, shale reservoirs? I think you're muted, Tom. Let's see. Uh, it's quite different to compare with the conventional reservoirs because uh, uh, the tightness of the reservoir really limit uh, the fluid to flow, and uh, so and very much the the hydrocarbon are still in their uh, saw stock. So uh, this makes things a lot of more simpler compared with uh, the petroleum system we have in conventional reservoirs. Even it's very difficult to produce, but on the on the distribution of the fluid inside the shale reservoir, it's, it is much more simpler compared with the uh, uh, conventional reservoir. If you look at uh, broadly about all the companies uh, producing uh, shale, oil and gas, and uh, who is doing the PVT work? Actually, most of the work is being done by the geochemist. So the geochemists use their uh, basic model, they use all the different uh, series, and uh, when the fluid are not leaving the home and uh, very tight constraint in the reservoir, so the geochemists have a very good success story in all the shale reservoirs. So in a way, like a lot of, you, you can see a lot of this, uh, like Eagle 4, there's a big shale, Curtis mentioned about these uh, variations of uh, different fluids. They have a relative consistent uh, variations from one direction to another direction. And, uh, the thermal maturity and uh, many people point out uh, in different publications, thermal maturity become the, the dominant factor about uh, how the fluid are distributed. So you have a, typically you have the 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 the, the black oil on the top and uh, the dry gas at the bottom. So this is a kind of a relative simple. This is why that uh, when we work on it and uh, let's. Chris mentioned about the sampling is a very difficult and this actually uh, this uh, consistency of all the shale uh, system make it possible to use other tools to actually look into how the uh, oil and gas distribute in the, in the reservoir. For example, you can actually uh, we have a I have a SPE distinguished lecture uh, presentation in 2017 and basically what we have done there is uh, we we correlate all the PVT properties with only single parameter, which is a gas oil ratio. And we can use uh, surface gas, surface oil, or mud gas, all the different source of the field data. And you can actually come back to estimate the GUR, and then you pop up to even the composition. So for Eagle 4, like, uh, you know, we're talking about several hundred wells and the production optimization and they need to assign a composition for each well so without any sample and uh, how to do this so that's what uh, you know we use this uh, very simple approach we just uh, use a uh, surface gas composition which is uh, mandatory you have to measure over several months and uh, you use that the simple uh, surface gas composition you can actually estimate that you are this is a one part, but the, the difficult part, probably a lot of people have a question is about uh, uh, all this uh, liquid yield over time. And uh, maybe you don't see exactly the same as from the PVD samples. And there's a lot of discussion on that. And that is uh, probably the hard part. And uh, getting everything physical in shale, uh, maybe it's not that uh, easy to do just like in conventional reservoirs. We can have a physical model and all the development investment plan and everything is based on the physical model. But uh, for shale, uh, gas and oil, and uh, maybe, you know, to, to put uh, some other data in and the production data, what you learn from the, what uh, you have done in the past and uh, sometimes uh, without the full understanding of the physics uh, sometimes it's working. So uh, I think there is a hybrid approach in industry and there's still a lot of simulation work ongoing, but uh, we have to uh, look at the result uh, with a little different glass and uh, to really uh, how much is fast on the prediction. That's also, this is a very big topic we, we can never cover uh, within this uh, short time. So I will stop here. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll just make a real brief comment that we we've seen ourselves and, and I think a lot of the other companies are seeing that to really understand the GOR variations in time for these different basins and different types of you, you have to do some kind of reservoir model that, that couples the producing GOR to the PVT and and the uh, multi-phase flow. And there's different way approaches to do that, different ways to do that. Uh, and I think that's that's uh, an approach that's being used and somewhat successful for, for different operators. Very good. So I'm going to switch focus a little bit because we we uh, we talked a lot about generating PVT or black oil PVT properties from equations of state in the presentation. And, I, and many of the questions we get is a little bit uh, they're a little bit confused because we already have a compositional model. Why are we not uh, first using the compositional model to do the modeling? And then second, when is it actually okay to use black oil tables? generated from an equation of state uh, uh, for modeling of gas uh, concepts and when it not. And I thought I could direct that question to you, uh, even as you have a very good paper on this topic from 2000 and, uh, or probably in 2000 on guidelines for choosing compositional and black oil models for volatile oil and gas concept uh, reservoirs. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you, you know, I, uh, it's uh, the reason for not doing everything straight out from a compositional model is that it usually has uh, takes much more time you know it's much more uh, time cpu requirement uh, required for doing everything compositionally uh, than doing it black oil so 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 but of course if that is removed then then there is no reason not to just use a compositional model uh, there might be some <clears throat> very special ultra high pressures where the compositional model may require special attention because uh, the compressibility of uh, the fluid may not be right correctly represented. So, uh, but and and there actually doing a manual changes to your blackboard table to honor the compressibility of the fluid is much easier in a blackboard model than in a compositional model. So, so that's uh, uh, one reason uh, black oil uh, to, to use black oil. And then you know we've shown for many systems in the paper you're referring to that for any sort of depletion type of uh, production black oil and compositional is very very similar uh, you, you know the uncertainty or the again of the bias or differences caused by using black oil or compositional is is clearly overshadowed by any of the other uncertainties we have in in simulation and rock properties uh, around the and, and then for for reservoirs with the uh, uh, gas injection or or injections where we actually have an impact of uh, interchange of oil and gas components so it's mainly you know any type type of gas injection but mainly hydrocarbons or co2 uh, there there in many cases you, you can use black oil tables but then it's uh, often you have to to limit the vaporization of of condensate into the oil phase into the gas phase because the, the oil is getting heavier after the first contact. So, so, but again, if you are first contact miscible, again, black oil seems to give a very good representation. But, but I guess, you know, it's a quite a complicated to go through all these examples. But in general, uh, gas injection, uh, and it's not, not miscible, be careful. Gas injection is always miscible, miscible above dew point. Uh, Below dew point, it's it's quite good. If if not, the miscibility is a very important issue. Uh, uh, you know, like what we saw in this figure, where we showed the recovery mechanism. If vaporization is the main part of that, then even there you may want to reduce the vaporization as a function of number of contacts. Uh, and then for depletion, uh, black oil is as good as the compositional. Very good. And the, and the paper number that um, we refer to is SPE 63087. That's from Utah. Um, very good. Um, a lot of the other questions, uh, Curtis, have been around gas uh, cycling in, in gas concentrate reservoirs uh, specifically. Is there anything like the generic rule of thumbs, uh, anything in, in particular that's special about the uh, that or is it a lot of similarities to be injecting gas into a into an oil reservoir? 
you don't uh, I, you don't have gravity effects like you do in gas oil, gas injection oil reservoirs. That at least much, much lesser so. Um, so the volumetric sweep uh, that that you might see being for in a gas injection in oil reservoir for high perm reservoirs uh, definitely won't be such a big problem for gas condensate. So the volumetric sweep will be more dominated by. Uh, permeability variation with layering. So um, I think that is 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 one thing. Um, so gravity segregation is less important usually. Um, And Avon can, can probably go through this much better than me. Um, the only one that immediately comes up, uh, let me just make this uh, layer. Okay, but, but let me then continue while you're making the figure, Curtis. Uh, I, I think that, you know, in, in a gas cycling project, you are very often more dependent on gas being displaced by gas and that by that getting the increased recovery. So you're much less dependent on viscosity reductions or oil swelling and oil vaporization. So, so in a sense, it's often a, 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 a much more efficient process. Uh, gravity uh, drainage or gravity segregation is the gravity difference in density is much less between gas gas and or between oil and gas. So depending on your reservoir, in many cases, there is an advantage of having a large difference in density to stabilize it. But in other reservoirs, it may not. So, so, so that can be both ways. Uh, but, but in general, what we've seen uh, in, when we're doing gas injection, it's mainly because the gas we don't have a good enough or high enough market. So, gas cycling is used to maximize the oil production or condensate production, while you still can't sell all your gas. So, you you have a higher capacity of gas production than you have of gas sales. So the, the difference is then used by gas injection to improve uh, the, the condensate recovery, but also to have a high initial oil production without uh, a large gas sale contract. So that's the, usually the main reason for actually doing gas cycling. It's very few places where we've seen that gas cycling has been uh, a reason for pure economical reasons. Uh, if you have a good gas market. Yeah, because on a relative basis also, you can just make the comment that depletion recovery factors of condensate, even bad situations are in the 30, 30 to 40 percent range, which obviously is much is better than for, for oils, most oils. Um, and then, so, so the having the gas available or no market that I think that was uh, one that you said a lot of things I was trying to make sure I, I, I got down um, all of those basically in a gas condensate where a lot of the oil is still in solution in the reservoir gas so basically any injection gas is going to get all of that solution condensate recovered near near 100 percent so that's Whereas in an oil reservoir, less of the oil target is is in the gas phase. Um, what else, uh, Avon? Did seems like you said one other thing I should include here. Um, I'm not sure. I maybe maybe not. Uh, interestingly, you know, Muscat. <laughs> Probably not, not too many people remember it. Muscat standing papers on the first papers on gas condensate cycling as a as a EOR method were in the 40s and, and 50s by Morris Muscat and, and standing. And basically in both cases, they they only look at how the permeability varied with depth, but basically the, the heterogeneity of 
of layering, permeability layering, controlled uh, the success or failure of the gas cycling project. Um, it was much less dependent on the microscopic kind of recovery efficiency, which was considered to be high. But um, okay. And I think the point five maybe could be that there's you know barely any viscosity differences, which may you know points to this uh, between the gas injection gas and the reservoir gas, while the oil and gas injection is, is quite a large difference. Yeah, which which makes this uh, you know that it's it's really a perm uh, volumetric sweep issue and not so much mobility about perm viscosity right. issues. Yeah. Yeah. So the very good, very good. So I see we're running out of time. So I, I have two questions uh, more, one for you, um, Evan, and one for uh, Tao. Um, the first one is, I guess, so We lost you, Matthias. Related to your, your, your uh, first comment. Well, uh, we, we lost you a bit on the question. Yeah, sorry about that. So the question to Ivan is, what is the best mitigation slash solution once blockage has occurred? You know, uh, it, it's the, the, the best solution is actually to, to, to stimulate it. If it's possible to do a uh, hydraulically fracturing of a well, that would mi mitigate this, like it is mitigating for unconventional. So, but of course, I realize you can't create those type of uh, fractures. But but that is is the way of, of doing it. There, there are chemicals uh, that has been tested and shown to be successful or been reported very successful in in the in the literature. Uh, they they but they so far they contain fluoride material, which is uh, in our way totally banned. So we had to uh, in our company not to use them because they are not acceptable. But there has been tests both in U.S. and in in the Middle East, uh, showing that, that they they have a pronounced good good effect uh, uh, to to actually improve, uh, make the oil and gas more linear and actually uh, make a more gas wetting uh, in, instead of a liquid wetting uh, phase. Uh, and and they they I'm seeing core experiments and it works. But what seems to be what you should be aware of if you lose quite a bit of your well deliverability is that it could be scaling issues, either due to backflow uh, or that you have vaporized uh, the, all the, the formation water, so you're getting salt out. Uh, and then, so, so so there could be other reasons for losing well deliverability than condensate blockage. And that we've seen several times. So, so um, be careful what your, if your well deliverability usually drops with more than 50%, there is something else than condensate blockage. Uh, then it's causing it. Very good. And I, I was I was so tempted to actually give you another question on the spot here, uh, even related to uh, the ECM procedure that uh, you presented also in that uh, that 1994 paper. Um, so we have a question. Uh, we are planning to conduct the ECM procedure on surface samples. Uh, to fix the uh, uh, the dew point of our concept, uh, the paper is kind of old now. Can you please confirm that these these procedures are still valid? Yeah, yeah. You know, we have never seen that they're not uh, the no, no uh, they are not good. So uh, depending on you know, if you have a sample that produced during coning, it just re recalibrate it to gas oil contact conditions and and remove the gas. If you're lacking, uh, so that you you know you're just lacking the the oil components, but you have an oil sample, you, you will get a more an average composition of the gas. Uh, they compensate than than actually the GOC compensate composition. But but we we have looked at this with several experiments uh, uh, done uh, commercially, and and there's no no change to the advices. I think. Maybe Curtis, you would like to comment on that? Yeah, no, I also have not really seen situations where it lacks, where, where it kind of uh, experimentally disproves the, the what was shown in the paper, which 
which was computa a computational paper, but for the purpose of designing laboratory experiments. So it's it's a pretty heavy paper. It's a, a, there are a lot of potential different applications for using this method. Um, so it's kind of you have to take a deep dive into it. But no, there's nothing that uh, that I that I have seen that negates any of any of the um, results from that paper. Very good. So the last question goes to you, Tao, and it's actually related to uh, this um, uh, mud gas type of technology that uh, has been developed at uh, Equinor, uh, and it's related to uh, whether that technology is applied uh, same for gas concept reservoirs as it is applied for oils, or if there's any particular difference there. Uh we have some publications. Uh, you can search in uh, one patch and uh, you can actually uh, get all the details. And uh, a short answer is uh, this method is based on the, the gas reading. The, the, you know, we have this degasser on the rig or platform. So you have the gas reading and you need to have a sufficient gas reading from C1 to C5. And, uh, you know, when we developed this method, actually, we initially, we didn't really manage and uh, because uh, we always have the same headache as the people in the industry for uh, many years. And uh, this is a condition that not always, not all the system actually manages that because uh, the most of the problem is uh, with a biodegraded fluid. If you have a biodegraded fluid, your C2, C3, C4, C5 will reduce quite a lot. And this is a killer of any of the methods that you try to develop based on the uh, mud gas uh, reading. So when we develop this technology, once we actually found out the problem, we removed all the samples actually are biodegraded. Once you remove that, so it's very much uh, you can apply to all the systems. Uh, as Curtis uh, wrote to the composition there, and the mud gas use the air as a carry gas. So in a way, you don't really have a good reading on CO2 or nitrogen or all these uh, components are actually in the air. So if you have a, like a gas condenser with a very high CO2, this is not working very well. And uh, so we're mainly use a composition from C1 to C5, seven components, and uh, they are basically working uh, very well for all the uh, fluid from the lean gas to uh, not heavy oil. So uh, when you start to lose all the light components and then it's not working. So this is uh, very much the limitation. I'm gonna call them normal oils. Would that be like a 30-ish API? Yeah, black oil and uh, it's working fine. So actually, these are all the uh, all the fluids that are really off values. So you work on uh, if you can find a normal black oil and the normal gas condensate. This is all the values, mm -hmm. and uh, the very dry gas and uh, very heavy oil. I think in today's environment, it's you can ask even probably not a lot of green lights there. Yeah, well, this has been this has been real fun, uh, guys. I, you know, the the only downside to this is not being able to see and interact with the audience. Uh, that's that's a real bummer. But um, you know, the the questions that have been written in, we'll try to uh, to maybe address some of those uh, collectively, um, group them in, and and maybe send out uh, some some answer responses if there's some of the questions that many people had that were similar. So uh, I've tried to be a good uh, secretary here. <laughs> um, scribe, I think they call it, um, did my best. And I wanna thank everybody for taking the time. And uh, hopefully you'll find the paper useful if it's new to you. Um, and uh, Avon, Tal, really appreciate it. Uh, Matthias, uh, thanks for helping organize this and uh, and uh, everybody have a safe a safe day bye bye now bye 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 bye